Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. Our guest on the show today is Steve Daly, the CEO of Instructure Holdings, a $3.6 billion market cap educational software company. After serving on the board of the company, Steve became the CEO in late 2020, right in the middle of a pivotal time for the company. Instructure's core products consist of cloud-based learning management systems used by higher education and K-12 schools all around the world. Listeners may not be familiar with Instructure, but the Canvas brand is likely something many people have heard of or even used. In 2020, the COVID outbreak presented all kinds of challenges for schools, especially when it came to figuring out how to use technology to continue the education process in a remote environment. Given how well Instructor is positioned to help schools embrace new technologies, I was excited to hear from Steve about how the outbreak of COVID impacted the demand for learning management systems in both higher ed and K through 12, why cloud systems are better than on-premise systems and how that leads to very low churn among customers, penetration rates of learning management systems across end markets and the different strategies Instructure employs to grow, how the company went from being quite unprofitable to generating very attractive margins in a short period of time, and how Tomo Bravo's Orlando Bravo convinced Steve to join the board of Instructure and eventually become the CEO. For full disclosure, Co Street is not an Instructure shareholder. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Instructure CEO, Steve Daly. As always, we will start this podcast off at a pivotal moment in the company's history. A good place to begin is when you became CEO. Steve, you came into the CEO position via the board. Would you tell the story of how Orlando Bravo from Toma Bravo originally convinced you to get involved with Instructure and what initially made you intrigued about being CEO? Yeah, you know, um, I had worked with Orlando before, so I had done a company with him. Um, it was Landes Software. We we had carved it out, and um, I had been with Toma for um, it was it was about six years. We ended up selling the company um, to Clear Lake Capital, and then I was with that. I was with the combined company. They combined us with a portfolio, one of their portfolio companies, um, for about three years, and then I'd stepped down, and so. Um, I had wanted to, you know, take some time off. I wanted to go do some, you know, give back uh, work. Uh, and um, and um, Toma called and said, "Hey, we got this company. We're gonna, we think we're gonna take private in in your backyard in Salt Lake City. You know, how would you like to be on the board?" And uh, so I thought, "That's great. I'll, I'd, I'd love to do that." And after they had worked a little bit with the prior CEO and the prior CEO didn't want to continue forward, uh, they came back and said, hey, we'd love you to run the company. And so I got a call from Orlando. And, um, uh, you know, Orlando is a very charming person. Uh, and uh, and so he asked me, you know, what, you know, what would, what would I be interested? And you know, I felt pretty good about myself saying no to Orlando because it's really hard to say no to him. And um and I said, look, I, I, you know, I think it's too early. It's too quick. Uh, I, I, I've got some of these things I'd like to do philanthropy wise. And, 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 you know, he, we had a really good conversation and, you know, Orlando is just one of those salt of the earth kind of people. He's, 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 he's real. And, uh, you know, he, he explained to me how his philanthropy work kind of scratches one of his itches, right. Of giving back and, and helping, you know, leave the world better than, you know, than it was when he got here. And then, 
how business also scratches a different itch, right? Because the pace is much faster than philanthropy. And he kind of left that in the back of my mind. And um, and so I, you know, I, I stayed on the board, did uh, a couple more board meetings, and and I started to recognize that, you know, Instructure was one of those companies, um, first of all, where I thought, you know, the business was um, on a trajectory, the business needed to change some things that I had done before, right? With my you know, in my tenure at tenure at um, a land desk, uh, but also that it was also one of those places where I could scratch that philanthropy um, itch in a, in a different way, right? B- because the mission of of Instructure is really to ensure access to education um, to everybody, and uh, that idea of being able to actually help and and change generations through the you know use of technology in the classroom kind of kind of hit a double, and so. That that little seed that Orlando had planted in the back of my head, right? Um, and I don't know if that was his intention or not. I'm sure it was. Um, but um, then I finally came back and I said, "Hey, um, let's talk. Let's see if we can make this happen." Because uh, I think this is this is such a tremendous opportunity, personally as well as as professionally. And when we first met, you mentioned to me that this company had a history of going for growth at all costs, mm-hmm. and. Um, I was listening to a podcast that Orlando Bravo did with um, Patrick O'Shaughnessy on Invest Like the Best. And one of the things that he said is that it's really hard to go from growth at all costs to generating 25% EBITDA margins overnight. And I'm not saying you guys did that overnight, but this company's actually achieved that. Um, I'm interested in, in the operational and cultural changes that were made you know, to, to make that happen. And then maybe how did that, how did your prior experience help you achieve that so quickly with this company? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, uh, I think, you know, it, it, there is a big cultural, uh, you know, I'm glad you asked that question because there's a big cultural aspect of, of when a company wants to change like that. And um, I think that's what Orlando was kind of referring to is you really, there, there really has to be some sort of impetus um, either, you know, either something like going private or, you know changes in the leadership in order to do that, but you know there were a couple things that um, that really stuck out. Is first of all, I think there's this um, you know there's this belief, and I know it was it was true at Instructure was that you couldn't be mission focused and kind of bottom line focused, right? That they they were almost like they were mutually exclusive, uh, and so part of that was just. Uh, first of all, starting with the the management team and and helping you know kind of lay out a path that should look, we could be both, right? And, and and that's a good thing, right? That's that's you know, when you're when you're able to generate cash, you're not living on other people's money, um, that's a good thing for your business uh overall. And so it was it really started with that management team and getting buy-in. And they and to their credit, right, they all bought in, they all saw it, they, you know, many of them kind of saw it even before, you know, before I came in. And so um, it, it started with 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 that, and then it was really a question of um, a lot of times when the conversations would come up about investment, it was always, well, you know, we're going to cut investment, but you're still going to have to do just as much work as you did before. And so we went through a pretty rigorous process of saying, okay, what do we want to focus on? And we decided, you know, we're going to be a an education company. Um, the company had some assets in corporate learning. Uh, we said we're going to really focus. We're going to, you know, take away a lot of the distractions. We're going to make sure that every dollar that we spend is, you know, has a return on investment. Um, and and that was kind of the process that we went through to say, okay, we are going to cut some investment here. Um, we're going to add in other places. We're just going to make sure we're investing in the right in the right places. And so. Um, uh, and then I'd say the final thing was um, it was, it, you know, for the management team, probably, you know, the hardest thing. And I found this when I did this before uh, with Landesk was um, really making sure that everybody was bought in on on this and that it was, you know, we were doing this because we knew this was the right thing to do, not because it was being opposed upon us, right, by a new owner and things like that. And that one's a hard one. That one, you know, um, because things change, right? When you go private like that, or you carve out, um, and and so everybody just attributes that to the new owners, and you know this is their model. And but so it really was a process of uh, I had to spend some time with the management team, team helping them, you know, understand. Okay, this is how we're going to create value. This is 
this is why this is a good thing. Uh, and, and again, to their credit, they got on board and they were able to bring the whole organization along in that change. And I can imagine in, you know, making both cultural changes and operational changes, you want to be careful not to have your customers impacted by, by what happens there. So when you did, you know, come from the board and actually be, come in the CEO seat and actually start talking to customers, what did you hear from them about what they thought you needed to change? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So they saw a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of problems with the business. They, um, but the, you know, the, the first thing they said was, first of all, don't change how you work with us. Uh, you work with us different than anybody else, right? Your, your ability to connect, you know, we have about half of our employees are customer success employees. Uh, and about half of those are former educators. And they said, look, we, we, you talk our talk, you walk our walk, you've, you've been in our shoes. We, you know, don't change the way you work with us. But then, you know, um, they said, look, you guys start a lot of things, but you don't finish, right? You go on to that next shiny object. And that's part of, you know, what I found uh, with growth at all cost companies is there's not that, you know, you don't necessarily have that discipline to make the tough decision, right? Because there's so much cash flowing and you've got the investment. And so you, you know, you do a lot of things um, and you, you know, go a mile wide and an inch deep. And so they said, just, you know, focus on a few things. And they gave me some ideas of what those were and, um, and go, go deep on them, you know, finish, finish what you started on those. Cause that would be really, those are really valuable to us. Uh, and so, uh, so that was probably the, you know, the two, the two main pieces of feedback was focus your efforts and finish things. And, and, but, you know, keep working with us the way you do, because you're, a, you're an example to us, to other vendors on how to work with us. And when we first spoke, um, you mentioned that uh, the team was willing to pivot as, as you've addressed, but mm -hmm. to create a built to last company. I'm interested in, in what that specifically meant to you within the context of your software products and end markets. Like what, what is a built to last concept the con, uh, company actually entail? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's a couple of things, right? It's um, first of all, it's, it's kind of debunking this notion that, you know, that mission driven and profitable are, are mutually exclusive. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the, the important thing for us was that, we are, you know, we're doing we're doing things that that can affect society, right? And 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 generations to come. So we want to be a company that's around for those generations uh, and able to impact that. And so, you know, some of it was about um, this idea that you know we we've got to pay our way, right? We've got to be profitable. We got to generate cash. We can't, you know, live on. Uh, other people's money, you know, in the private sector, you know, that would be going for more rounds in the public sector, you know, you pretty quickly get, get uh, sussed out by activists and right. And we just said, we don't want to, we don't want to go through that again. So let's create a, you know, a business that, uh, that pays for itself. And then the other piece was, um, you know, a lot of the way that we scaled prior to the take private was we'd just throw more bodies at it. And we'd say, you know, okay, we want to do this. Let's go hire 10 people and go, figure out how to do it. Or, we, you know, we, we, we just, you know, hire, hire people uh, to solve problems that we, we could solve with either process or programs or technology. So uh, we kind of put our money where the mouth is. This, you, I mean, we talk a lot in education about our technology can help you become much more effective as a teacher and much more efficient in what you do. And we kind of took that same mantra on ourselves to say, okay, how can we do this in a way that allows us to scale uh, you know, because eventually you run into a brick wall if, if you got to go hire 500 more people and, you know, prove, you know, prescient in this market where it's been hard to hire five people, right, <laughs> in the past two years. So, uh, so those were kind of the two big pieces, learn how to scale as well as, you know, pay, you know, pay our own way uh, as a company. Uh, and, it, you know, and, and we feel really, really pleased with, with where we've got, gotten to at that, at this point. Um, and that was really, you know, to your early question about how do you do it? Uh, the, that's, the, that really is, you know, what drove us is looking at how do we do this in a way that scales profitably. And one way to future proof this company and make it last, I think my guess is, is to be more cloud and less on-prem. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the products and how, how, how that works in your end markets, but I'm interested in just how that all transpired and, and thinking about, should this be a cloud native, you know, company versus, you know, should we have some on-prem? Yeah. What, how, how did that all, how, how did that all settle out? 
Yeah, you know, this was a pre- this was a you know um, a premise of the original investment thesis, right? So the 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 people that started this company, there were a couple of graduate students um, that didn't like the experience that they were having. They said, "Hey, we think we can do this better." Um, you know, this was this was twelve years ago now, and they were saying, "Why don't why don't we do this in the cloud? Let's let's not you know all the technology was mostly prem at the at that time." And said, "Hey, um, you know, this is we're talking about remote. Um, you know, cloud is is built for that, right? It's 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 you know the network at scale. Um, it's there's a lot of advantages to our customers uh, being cloud native in that you know uh, they can take advantage of our expertise as far as operations go, running running cloud environments. You know, the security." take advantage of, you know, the, the expertise that we get to leverage from our suppliers like AWS and, uh, you know, have a, a much more resilient and secure environment, right, than, um, than a lot of our customers could. You know, a, a K-12 district uh, in Oklahoma, um, you know, um, the investment in IT uh, isn't nearly as, as, uh, as big as our investment in IT, right? And so, um, so that's that's part of the advantage. The other advantage by being a cloud company is um, we can get real time feedback on you know is is stuff being used in the environment? Is it not? You know you can get feedback. You can do pulse surveys to get feedback right away. Why why isn't this working for you? And so that ability to respond so much quicker than than premise software um, is uh, is an inherent advantage for our customers in that they get to, you know, they get to the benefit from faster and faster innovation uh, because, because of that real-time feedback that we're getting our ability to do A-B testing, all of the, all, all of those advantages of being so connected with our customers going forward. So that, that's really what's driven our, um, you know, right from the beginning of the founding of the company. And I can imagine, especially some of your K through 12 customers might be hesitant to, you know, whatever, if they have an on-premise provider move to the cloud or just, you know, whatever, any any kind of technological change could be kind of jarring for an institution. You know, what what have you seen as the barriers to to kind of moving to more of a a cloud offering and and how, you know, what is the strategy to overcoming those? Yeah, you know, early on it was about it was about things like security. Do we want to, you know, data privacy? Do we want to put that in the cloud? Um, you know, I think largely in in North America, you know, we, I think we've we've come to terms with that, right? Clearly, clearly, we have all gotten comfortable with uh, with cloud technologies, and the reality is. Um, you know, as I said earlier, we can we can make an investment in security um, that it doesn't make sense for every single comp- you know every single one of our customers to make a, a similar investment. It's just much more efficient for us to do it that way. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, it, you know, for a while there it was well, we've got all these people that are running the system right that's on prem, and and what do we do with them? But I think you know with with the tight labor market, um, and and just you know, and and this has been true in IT for years, not just you know in the last couple of years, but um, there are so so much to do uh, within those IT environments that you know at the the idea that instead of keeping software up and running in a data center, I can go work on some strategic projects and figure out how does this you know how does this help student outcomes, right? How does this help our teachers? Are track and retain teachers, or that, that it's a much more uh, strategic use of resources um, once you move to the cloud because you don't have to worry about keeping those things up and running. So I think those are kind of the that that's where the the early um, resistance was, you know. And we're seeing in the international markets, um, I think we're it, you know the adoption of the cloud, the acceptance is a, is a little bit further behind uh, where the U.S. is right now. So. We're still, we're still, we're still having those conversations internationally, but in the U.S., it's kind of past us. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegasco slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, 
and industry experts, all of which are in position to offer unique insights into company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders, Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, Head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. So let's dig into the products and the markets a little bit. I think it would be helpful if we bifurcate your markets to talk about the industry structure and growth opportunities within each. So let's just start with U.S. higher ed. Uh, maybe for people who are not familiar with the, um, you know, kind of the LMS world, can you talk about the relative market share of the major players and penetration rates of, of learning management systems? And also maybe talk about the growth strategy that you guys have within higher ed. Yeah. Yeah. In the U.S. higher ed, um, um, the, you know, everybody has some sort of learning management system or LMS. And um and so really when we go in, it's, it's, it's a displacement sale. It's about convincing them about, you know, this is the right architecture. This is the right technology for your digital transformation for the next, you know, couple of decades. And so um, to the, the market today, we have the latest numbers show we have about 42% of all U.S. higher education institutions are using Canvas, uh, our learning management system. Um, about 40% of the market is um, still kind of legacy, either Blackboard, which has historically been on-prem, as well as Moodle, which is an on-prem open source. And so uh, what we've seen is that during the, you know, during the pandemic, those, it was really hard to keep those up and running, those systems. And, and now that we're kind of out of the firefighting of the pandemic, and we're trying, and we're coming back to a, a, a new normal. Um, you know, institutions are looking at okay, what's my, you know, what's my strategy for the next decade or two? And so, uh, we're seeing a lot of a lot of activity, a lot of um, RFPs that are out there now to 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 look at a new LMS. Uh, and so, for us, you know, it's it's primarily that other forty percent of the market that's still legacy technologies that. Um, that we're we're going after from a you know from a growth perspective. In addition, we have other products that we've added to the portfolio. You know, this is another part of that you know built to last is um, you know more than more than a, you know more diverse product portfolio so that we can you know we can we can have more touch points with our our customers. And so we we also cross sell other solutions into the higher ed market after we've plowed all this ground with the LMS sales. And you mentioned that COVID was kind of a eye opener for a lot of organizations that were running uh, on-prem software. I'm interested in how, as you're seeing new RFPs and you're seeing your customers' needs evolve, what, what are you seeing? What kind of things are they asking for? What what things do you think they're going to need? You know, how do you guys look around the corner to help you know make sure that you can either both retain existing relationships and then maybe penetrate that forty percent a little better? Yeah, yeah, I you know. What, what I'm seeing is that um, customers in the higher ed space are, first of all, recognizing how critical the learning management system is as far as piece of infrastructure, right? Um, we did some workflow studies that show that 90% of all instructional workflows touch the LMS in some way. And so um, they're really, you know, they're really recognizing the importance of uptime, of, of reliability, scalability, security, uh, and they're looking for that from us. And so we continue to invest in those areas to, to, to you know, kind of harden the solution and make sure it's, it's there for them. The other thing in higher ed in the U.S. is we're seeing, you um, know, the last few years, we've seen declines in enrollments. Um, and, and some of that was pandemic related. Some of it's a little longer term trend. Um, and so what we see educational institutions doing is uh, recognizing that, you know, the 
the preferred method of education has always been, you know, go to go to college, get a four year degree or master's or whatever. And and that um, more and more students are opting to, you know, for that non-traditional experience and, and getting a certificate or, you know, uh, and, and and so uh, what we see a lot of our uh, customers doing is is creating programs for those non-matriculating students that are never going to come on campus right in in tempe arizona if you're arizona state uh to get a four-year degree but to be able to provide them with you know um training that they need maybe they want a data science certificate right or a coding you know in, in java type of certificate so they can go get a job and so uh, we see that as a one, uh, it's kind of an order of magnitude, more students that they can reach, you know, maybe, maybe two orders of magnitude, more students than they could reach it than that, you know, traditional student coming on campus. Um, but it also, you know, it becomes a blended opportunity for them, right. To use, reuse, you know, content that they're creating for their on, on campus and, and really reach a new student with that. So it's a growth opportunity for both them as well as us um, as a technology provider to them. And so we're we're extending a lot of our solutions in that way, you know, give, giving them storefronts to be able to go, you know, find and sign up new students, uh, allowing them to easily and, and seamlessly share the content between a, you know, an on-campus class and a, and a off, you know, an online class. And, uh, and so that's a big, I think it'll be a big growth factor for both us and our customers in the next decade. And do you have to design new software, new products, new technology to be able to service the certificate and non-degree programs? Or is it just kind of like an extra module on top of your existing LMS? Yes, yeah, for a lot of the a lot of the um, kind of workflows, it's the same. But yes, we've had to develop, you know, for instance, um, you know, the traditional way that you sign up for classes in a, you know, in a four-year degree is you've got to apply, right? You go through the uh, application process, you go through the registrar's office. Whereas when you, when, if you're signing up for online courses, it's more like a storefront, right? There's, and so we've created that storefront kind of uh, front-end interface that they can use to, to present their classes. And we call it catalog. It's a, it, it really is an online catalog of um, we've also we we acquired a company called Concentric Sky um, just about three months ago that uh, is has the technology to allow to allow the uh, institution to say okay I'm going to give them a badge when they complete this computer science course in programming in Java I'll give them another badge when they do that in Ruby uh, and then one when they when they do a you know a class in architecture. And then it allows them to stack those badges and say, once you get this done, you've got a com com uh, computer science uh, certificate, right? And so, so there are additional technology pieces that we've either acquired or built organically and integrated into that core Canvas platform so that it's all one seamless experience for them, whether regardless of how the, how the student is engaging. I think that was a really good summary of higher ed. Maybe let's move into K to 12 for a moment. So I'm interested, kind of same questions, LMS penetration in K through 12, you know, maybe what, what do ARPUs look like on a relative basis for a, a K through 12 versus, versus a higher ed? And then talk a little bit about your strategy to bring Canvas to more students and teachers in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. You know, K-12 is before the pandemic. Um, the LMS was kind of a nice to have, um, you know, because um uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons why was, um, you know, we had a generation of teachers who had 20 years worth of lesson plans sitting in a four drawer file cabinet in the back of their classroom, right? And um, <clears throat> to get them to put everything online and go digital, right? That's a that's a big lift. Uh, that's a lot in addition to, you know, just being a teacher. So uh, I think there was a little bit of kind of resistance uh, historically. The pandemic kind of changed all that, um, and a lot of those, a lot of that resistance kind of had to come down. And um, you know, now that now that those lesson plans are online for those that, that did make the change during the pandemic, um, you know, now they're recognizing that hey, you know, before I used to come in in the morning, I used to go to that file cabinet, grab the lesson plan, go make a copy, hand it out. You know, once the students fill it out, return it, I got to hand grade it, and then I got to put it into the grade book. Well, the, the LMS now automates that whole process, right? It, it, and 
uh, it'll even grade the grade the quiz or the homework for you if if you set it up right, and it's already integrated, you know, into the into the electronic grade book. And so uh, now now they're starting to recognize that hey, this actually makes my life a lot easier. All those kind of manual things that I used to have to do that you know that's not why I got into education. I got into inspire and and motivate you know students. It allows me to free up some time to do that, and so. We're seeing usage on a per, you know, on a per user basis uh, is much higher than it was pre-pandemic, even though we've come back into the classroom, right? Um, the other thing that's happened in, in K-12 education is um, a lot of government stimulus funding in the CARES Act when, you know, the pandemic first hit went to purchase devices for students. Uh, so we're now over 90% of all students have a device in the U.S. Uh, K-12 uh, systems, and so now you know now that now that the hardware infrastructure access, you know, a lot of there's a lot of you know uh, investment in uh, wireless access and, and getting uh, getting uh, students uh, hooked up to the system. Now it's about okay, now what do you do with that hardware? And so so now we're seeing them use um, those devices not just to learn from home, but in the classroom. Right, this, the teacher can uh, post the post the assignment. They can work on it in class on their on their device, um, and so so we're really starting to see a change in in the use of technology, you know, throughout the day uh, and in in K twelve education. Now we've got a we've got a real challenge, uh, and you, there's been a number of articles out recently as school comes back. There's just a massive shortage of teachers in the U.S. Uh, in the K twelve system, and so. Um, so that I think is going to be a huge challenge for us as a you know as a country. Um, how do, how do we deal with that? We you know we believe that technology can help with some of that, right? Um, and um, but really we're going to have to we're going to have we're going to have to fix this. I mean, there's going to be some you know policy. I think we're you know we're going to have to pay teachers better. I think we're, I think there's a lot of things that are going to have to happen. Um, and and the system is pretty stretched right now. Um, now. Uh, the, the federal government has created a lot of stimulus funds to help in the digital transformation. Um, it's um, came out with some of the pandemic relief funds. There's about $190 billion targeted for K-12 systems to be spent over the next two years. And so, uh, so really districts are really crafting their digital transformation strategies. Uh, and there's a good, there's a big catalyst behind that uh, for the next couple of years to help kind of um, to really kick that off within a lot of these uh, districts. You know, our, our footprint is um, there's about there's anywhere from 50 to 60% of all districts have an enterprise class LMS. The others are using free tools. Um, and that, that, you know, that two, a year and a half ago, that was 40%. So we're still, we're, we're seeing that continue to, to become more and more penetrated. But within that, we, we have about 45% of those paid implementations are, are using Canvas today. And so our strategy is continue to sell the LMS. Um, we have a much bigger cross-sell stack to sell to, K, to K-12. Um, in fact, if you look at our, our, our users, the average, you know, average selling price per user is about the same in, in K-12 or higher ed. We land a lot bigger on the LMS in, in higher education and um, and with a, a smaller amount on LMS um, in K-12, but there are assessment products. There's other products, a lot more products that we sell into the K-12. So, so cross-sell is a much bigger part of our growth strategy in K-12 than it is in higher ed. And um, you mentioned government a couple of times, obviously, anytime to K through 12 is involved, you know, local government, state governments, the federal government's involved. And I, one thing you mentioned to me when we met was that COVID kind of prompted more states to buy for the whole state, as opposed to letting schools make individual choices or med- letting individual districts make choices. What, what does that mean for the company? And what, what has it meant so far as you see more kind of like state level buying? Yeah, um, uh, you know that's been. We've always tended to call high in in the sales process, right? Uh, we we don't usually call it a school level. It's either a district or a state level. So, um, so for us, it was kind of a natural. It was natural from a sales motion perspective, um, and and um, and it benefited us. You know, there were twelve in in 2020, 2021, There were twelve statewide 
RFPs that were let and we won 11 of them. Uh, and so we, we've done really well, um, but really it was driven by a couple of things. I think the most important thing was, you know, states were looking at it from uh, equitable access to education perspective, right? And they're saying it doesn't really make sense. It's not fair. It's probably not legal that, you know, this wealthy district over here can afford an LMS and, you know, uh, respond to the pandemic and remote and all, and all the other things that were happening. Um, whereas this, this less affluent um, district that maybe doesn't have as many, you know, IT resources uh, can't. And so they said, let's, let's take that off the, off the plate and let's buy it for, for everybody um, at the state level. So that was probably the biggest driver of, of that move to, um, and then, and then the need to respond pretty quickly, right? So during the pandemic, uh, the, it, uh, you know, we kind of struggled through it that spring, right? Kind of March, April, May timeframe, and then, you know, getting ready for fall of 2020, um, you know, they, they had to move pretty quickly. And so they felt like, you know, let's, let's do it all at once and then let the districts deploy it, um, but take that kind of purchasing friction which there always is in any sort of state procurement processes, right? Um, let's try to reduce that. And we can't forget about um, the international business, which is smaller, but has been growing quite nicely over the last few years. So my first question as it comes to international is about bandwidth within the management team and playing to your core strengths. So it sounds to me like the, the way you lay out the growth opportunity in K through 12 and higher ed is that there's just a long runway. So why would you you know, kind of dilute your attention and, and maybe, um, you know, risk that something goes wrong in the, in the core business and fo by focusing on international? How, how have you weighed that balance? Yeah, you know, um, part of it um, and a big part of it is, has been that, you know, we are, you know, we're, you know, it's a much more globalized world now. And so a lot of our uh, a lot of our higher education institutions, we primarily we focus primarily on higher education outside of the U.S., uh, but a lot of them, right, are reaching students. One 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 of our institutions that we're working with, you know, has a goal to um, really help reach students in Africa, right? Even though it's a U.S. institution, uh, and so having that global footprint has been really important um, to, uh, you know, to a lot of our U S based institutions anyways. And so, um, so that, you know, being able to have that infrastructure that's around the world scales um, has been important to even our North American customers. And then the, the reality is that, um, you know, from a mission perspective um, there is, there's, you know, we think we're still got, we're, we're probably 10 years um, behind in the adoption of cloud-based technologies in education outside of the U.S. And so we think there is a real opportunity. The number one market share holder outside of the U.S. is Moodle, which is a open source on-prem software. And, and so we, we, we believe that, you know, part of our mission is also to, to help around the world um, extend the benefits of you know our cloud-based solutions to education so yeah it's it's a it i think i think of it as more of a necessity than uh than anything and it supports our our growth within the north american market as well and do you have to set up regional teams and sales forces and kind of like to set up shop in every country is that how it works and then i mean if that's the case how how would M&A play in this? Because I could see buying into a country maybe easier than like whatever, just a new greenfield operation of some kind. Yeah. Um, so we do, you know, um, one of the things we did at the Take Private was um, prior to the Take Private, we were in a bunch of countries. I think we we're in 138 different countries um, and, and we we're going after higher ed and K-12. So part of that focus exercise was to say, okay, um, you know, we know, we know what, what the market needs to look like in order for us to be successful, right? It has to, there has to be good cloud infrastructure. There's, it has to be a cultural propensity to use cloud. There has to be good student to device ratios, good spend on per student. And so we, we really just narrowed it down to kind of eight regions that we really wanted to focus on. Uh, and we've hired heads in there, you know, we, we've had, hired sellers, we've hired marketers, support, professional services, everything that goes along with those. 
Um, and and so yes, we we have made that investment um, to grow those international markets. And like I said, it supports our U.S. based customers, but also you know it, it gives us a, a presence in market. It, it allows us to continue to grow our business through you know expanding that footprint. Um, and so yeah, so it's a um, it it is something that we've had to make that um, investment going forward. Now this year we also. Um, have made an investment in a channel program. And, and that channel program is designed to go after those, those countries or those regions where we don't think you know, the return on investment um, is there initially. Uh, and so go in with more of a variable model, right? With a channel uh, until we get some scale in there um, or, or even just use it to grow that business um, you know, forever. So, uh, so we're, we're approaching it in a couple different ways as we go after those, uh, you know, those international, uh, new international markets for us. And you've talked a number of times about kind of shrinking to grow and focusing. And I'm a big fan of CEOs who apply kind of a portfolio manager's lens to his or her business and is willing to divest non-core assets. Um, so I'm, I'm along those lines. I mean, uh, you, you, talked about the decision to divest corporate learning, but maybe talk a little little bit how, you know, how that came about. Was that a board driven? Was that year driven? Like what, how did that come about that, that you just said we should be K through 12 and higher ed and, and corporate learning was kind of uh, superfluous. Yeah. Um, you know, it was from the inside, it was a lot easier to decision to make than maybe it looked like from the outside. Um, because when we, when we, when we started looking at it, um, the, the product that we had to create in order to reach that corporate market, because it was different, it is different than education. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of synergies between Canvas and that product, right? It was a separate product uh, altogether. Uh, and then we started looking at, uh, you know, the go-to-market and um, we looked at, you know, how we sold, how we, how we marketed, how we supported. Uh, and it was also different, right? There were different processes and um, it would it had been sucking a ton of resources. So it was a money loser for a number of years, and we couldn't see a way for it to get profitable um, very quickly because, again, there weren't a lot of synergies. It was like running a separate business. Uh, and so it actually became a pretty easy decision. You know, you look at you know, you look at the the change in the profile of the company over the two, you know, the two years since the take private and it looks pretty dramatic. But, you know, part of that was able, just by carving out that corporate business, right? We we improved the you know profitability profile pretty dramatically. Um, and and it allowed us, you know, to as a management team to focus on, you know, on what where where we had strength, right? Where we where we had a number one market share leading product and um, and really get to focus on a market that we knew we could win in. So yeah, it, it actually was a lot easier to make, you know, being able to see underneath the hood, right? And how the engine was actually running uh, than it looked like from the outside. And comp- companies often tell us that divesting problematic assets generates a lot of bandwidth that allows executives to focus on the core. It sounds like that's the case. You know, what was the, what was, what have you been freed up to tackle and to think about um, when you're not having to have constant meetings about what you're going to do with a money losing corporate business? Yeah, no, for, for me, I mean, for me personally, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because we went back out into the public markets right a year ago. And um, as I've thought, as I've really, you know, thought about, you know, where do I spend my time? You know, I've got to split it between customers. I got to split it between employees, investors now. Um, you know, there's a lot more investors than there were when we were just a private company. Um, yeah, I can't even imagine being able to balance that if when I think, when I talk about customers, employees, I've got two constituencies, right? There's two cohorts there, a, a business side and, a, and an education side. And so, you know, just from are the ability to reach that education customer um, is, you know, it's outsized to the size of the the disinvestment just from a dollar's perspective um, that allows me to really um, stay close to those uh, so to those customers. I, I don't know how I would do it if you know, if we were trying to divide it one more time, my time. We've talked a lot about culture and the kind of cultural pivot and the, the you know company focusing on on building a built to last organization. I'm interested in in the kind of values 
that, I mean, obviously there's, there seems to be a, a very philanthropic bent across the entire company, but just interested in cultural values um, that, that you're trying to embed, but also, you know, software is a little bit of an interesting industry. It's its own and has developed its own specific culture. So what, what kind, what kind of success is successful? What do successful cultures look like in software in your, in your idea? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, the, um, I think a lot of times it, 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 I mean, part of it's related to the fact that we're a software company. Part of it's related to the fact that we're, you know, we're in education. Um, one of the things when I went on a listening tour, um, one of the you know feedback that a few people gave me was, you know, you, you can't treat us like you would an enterprise customer, right? There's a, this isn't about, you know, there's a device to manage or secure, or there's, you know, infrastructure that you're taking care of. There are people and children and, you know, um, the future of our country that are on the other end of, of what your technology is doing. And so you really need to think about it differently. And, you know, you don't walk in, you know, with wingtips and, a, and you know, a suit like you would, uh, you know, uh, selling to an enterprise IT organization. Uh, and so our culture really is very... Um, very much more aligned with an education culture, which is that people, you know, people all feel that same sense of mission, right? That, that they're doing something that's bigger than just, you know, just, just uh, what they do on a day-to-day basis. Um, there's a, a sense of um, it's real people, you know, working with people and, and um, let's, let's, you know, let's get past some of the, um, positioning and let's just talk about how we can be successful. So, you know, we've, we've created a very open culture, um, very transparent. Um, you know, that was one of the differentiators that we were trying to establish even when the company was first um, established. Um, you know, it's a lot about relationships. Uh, it's a lot about, you know, uh, owning a problem so that the customer doesn't feel like they're, they're getting handed off or right. That they feel like once they get a hold of somebody, uh, and so, you know, from that perspective, I think um, the cu- culture is pretty unique. Um, and and really, you know, we we are, you know, uh, we're playing in the education market. We are more like a vertical software company. Um, but I think that that part of the culture is is different than I've experienced it within software. It, but but as a software company, you know, it um, market share matters. Right, because you've got low fixed, you know, low. I mean, really high growth, gross margins. Right, and you've got pretty low fixed costs. You know, engineering tends to be fixed, but um, and so you know, the the ones that that win market share tend to be the ones. It's it's a very leveraged model, right? It, you get outsized returns, and if you're not, you get outsized losses, right? And so. So, um, so the, there is a there there has to be a culture of the company needs to continue to grow uh, as a software company, uh, and we can't just rest on our laurels. Uh, and so there is that sense of urgency in addition to the kind of every man culture that's created by serving a, an education customer. And when you talk about retention, uh, sorry, when you talk about market share, almost embedded in that implicitly or explicitly is retention, whether that's revenue retention or customer retention. So, you know, the rates of retention among software companies is, is traditionally really high, I guess, depending on where you are. But, you know, I'm interested to hear about the drivers that have allowed this company to achieve 110% retention levels. And um, maybe you can a little bit talk about, um, you know, a little to give us a little more information on the cross-selling and the upselling that you're able to do once you do have a customer um, who signed up for an LMS. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, the, um, you're right within software. Um, if you're, if you're in a vertical, right, you tend to be vertical market software, you know, t- retention rates tend to be pretty high, um, infrastructure a little lower. Um, but you know, it starts with us in making sure that that customer's well taken care of. So our, you know, our, our gross retention is really higher churn is, you know, low single digit churn. Um, and, um, and that kind of is sets a foundation for then, you know, we, we, we see uh, the ability to um, cross sell um, as, as a big driver for that net retention rate going up. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, our strategy has been, you know, prior to the take private, we're primarily a, a one product com- company. 
Uh, it's finding those pro those products that the the LMS touches first of all, um, but also has a similar either similar user or similar buyer, uh, so that there's a synergy for the customer. Not just you know we're not just selling you a bunch of different products that don't talk together and there's no synergy. And so so that's been a lot of our you know we've done uh, three or four acquisitions since the take private. Um, and and we've we've developed organically some some new products um, or invested more in them. All right, but they're all with that idea that it, there's got to be some sort of synergistic benefit for the customer in order to 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 make that um, make that work. So you know, really, really good. You know, very sticky solution. Very we're we're you know we're we you know we when we get a customer we keep it. We never lost the. Uh, fully deployed four-year uh, higher ed institution in the U.S. Uh, in the you know ten or twelve years of our existence, um, and but then you know they want they want to buy more stuff from us, right? And and as long as we make it you know synergistic for the customer, and there's a benefit for them buying from us. Then then that that's what drives that net retention up. When you talk about churn levels that low, and you know having never lost a single fully deployed. Um, institution in this company's history. That's suggestive that this company has a pretty strong moat. Um, and so this is a podcast about compounders and moats are a big part of that. Maybe just talk a little bit about, I think it's probably pretty obvious, but maybe talk a little bit more about why it's so sticky. And then what, if someone did want to switch away from, you know, a cloud uh, canvas product, for example, what, what would be the switching cost for that organization? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh... A big part of this is that it, it is so critical to the infrastructure, right? It's so critical to how teaching and learning is delivered um, that, um, you know, by, by implementing a, a learning management system, right, that, that there's a big lift if you wanted to change out because you'd have to retrain all of your faculty or your teachers, right, um, all your administrators, um, we have a partner program where we've integrated with over 600 different partners, have technologies that plug into our platform. And so, you know, as, as it gets deeper, you know, and as, as districts or institutions are integrating more products and creating, you know, unique experiences for their students or their teachers or parents, um, you know, all of that, um, all of that just kind of makes it much that much more sticky, if you will, uh, within within an organization. Now, um, the reality is, um, because this is you know education is so much about relationship uh, and so much you know there's a, it's a very referential sale. Um, you really as as a as an ed tech company really have to take care of your customers. You have to you know you have to make sure that you're you're not losing sight of their needs that you're keeping that 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 communication channel open um, because you know it the part of the moat is really once you once you get a position and are well respected and people are talking about you it you know it just it compounds on that go to market motion right and and it becomes much more efficient and effective and the fact that you know every Ivy League institution is using us you know the in the Nordics, uh, their higher education systems are all on Canvas. That you know, California Community College and CSU systems are all standardized on Canvas, right? When you get that kind of um, footprint, um, it just it just compounds, uh, and it really de it deepens that moat. Uh, you know, part of the other thing is we're also a company that is focused on both higher ed and K twelve, and so we've had you know deals. Uh, more so, even more so recently, where you know, for instance, a K twelve system in one of the states where we had uh, all of the higher education institutions said, "Look, I want my students to kind of get experience with Canvas in the you know in the post secondary, so that when they transition or when they transition on to post secondary, they can uh, you know they're familiar with the technology." We've had to work both ways, and so. You know, there are a number of network effects, uh, particularly in this market, um, where um, as you, uh, you know, success begets success um, and and kind of lowers your CAC, but also increases, you know, this the stickiness, right? And your, your resilience within the market. And another thing that often comes with a mode is pricing power. 
obviously inflation is a topic of conversation in basically on everyone's mind. My guess is, you know, software engineers aren't getting any cheaper. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about, you know, pricing power as, as you've watched it uh, evolve over the last few years. And then what are, you know, just mechanistically, how do you raise prices? Is it like kind of like an annual thing? Just, just give us a sense of how, how you do pass along pricing. Yeah, we do have annual pricing uh, price increases uh, that are built into our contracts, right? They're so they're annual escalators. Um, the contracts are you know, multi-year usually with three to five year contracts, non-cancelable, build, you know, annually. Um, and so, um, so we we have um, you know we have been able to um, get those price increases. Um, we did a few things during the pandemic. Uh, some of our competitors kind of you can use it went way up on the platform. You know, they dropped invoices on on their customers and said, hey, our costs are going up. We decided not to do that during the pandemic. You know, we said, look, you're dealing with a lot of things. We think some of this load is is uh, transient. Uh, and so we're not going to you know drop this unexpected bill on your uh, on your on your desk, um, but you know we're we're going to look at what it looks like after we get through the pandemic, and you know we may come back with a little steeper price increase. We we tend to get three to five percent uh, annually to kind of adjust for that. Um, you know the cost of living and the cost of engineers going up, uh, and so you know as we've come back out of it, um, you know customers have been appreciative of the partnership approach we took. They recognize that. Um, it's a different environment and, and you know, and, and so we were able to have those conversations with them that says maybe this year it's going to be, you know, a bigger increase in those three to 5% uh, that we've done in the past. Um, so, but really, you know, um, trying to take a partnership approach rather than kind of a mechanistic, you know, we're just bang, 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 you know, it's a, it's a factory type of, you know, mentality is really important with this customer, uh, you know, the customer that we're serving. And I want to talk a little more about capital allocation. We talked about the divestitures and the asset sale, but you know this company generates high margins, fair amount of cash. There's not a lot of capex required. Maybe talk a little bit about priorities for cash and and you know where does debt pay down um, fit within all of that? Yeah, yeah, no, we are we are generating um, great cash flow. You know, I think our unlevered free cash flow is going to be you know high hundred, you know between 150 200 million this year. Um, and we've, we've, we, you know, we have a, a strategy of growth through acquisition. And so uh, that's primarily how we're going to use that cash. We'll, you know, we'll pay down debt in the short term, you know, uh, strength or, you know, keep the cash on the balance sheet, lower our net, net uh, leverage ratios. But, you know, we do, um, we do feel like, you know, we're in a really nice position. We've got a good cash position. Um, we've got favorable terms on our existing debt. We've got revolvers available. So we, you know, we've got a really robust balance sheet to put to work um, from an acquisition perspective. And as we go into this, you know, uncertain times and, you know, capital becomes a little uh, more difficult to raise, right? We think it's, you know, we think there's going to be an opportunity for a company that's, you know, that's got a strong balance sheet, you know, is running, is running well, um, to, to be able to make some, pick up some acquisitions over the next, you know, six to 12 months. And my guess would be that the primary focus would be on technology or modules or just kind of additions to the, you know, to whatever you're cross-selling as opposed to, hey, here's a smaller player in LMS, let's just buy another LMS player and kind of discontinue their product. How how would you see that going as, as you're thinking about where to put capital to work? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you characterize it right, right? The, I mean, there we could do a market share um, kind of roll up play. Um, you know, we'd be very thoughtful about whether we did that. You know, to your earlier point, there might be an opportunity in some of these markets that were outside the U.S. where they've got a good foothold. Um, so we do watch those, those, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we're looking at is, um, you know, adjacent technologies or technologies that we think can accelerate some of our existing organic uh, development, uh, and so and that's that's where we've done that's where we've done basically all of our acquisitions so far in the last two years. And one thing um, we've we've invested in a number of companies where the private equity owners still owned a big stake, and 
we got a we got a nice secondary uh, thrown into our laps recently. Um, but I mean, I think it's important to address, right? Like if someone's coming into this company, they're going to see that Tama Bravo still owns a fair amount of the stock. M- maybe just talk us through how you, you know, would like people to, to view, you know, their ownership. And obviously that's, a, you know, there's an exit at some point. How, how, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. You know, I, I, um, you know, I view it as a vote of confidence in the strategy, right? So, um, the you know Toma, they're smart investors, right? They've been super successful. They they um, they recognize opportunities. They didn't sell anything in the IPO. Um, you know that was a chance for us to strengthen our balance sheet, give us some, you know, a different type of um, uh, give us equity in order to attract and retain talent, um, give you know more visibility to our customers, to our financials, things like that. Um, and, and the fact that they haven't sold yet is to me a testament that they, you know, they see a lot of upside uh, in the business. Now, they also, you know, they make their money by, you know, selling, uh, selling that equity. So, you know, they'll be very thoughtful about, you know, how they exit, right. They'll recognize that they, you know, that they'll do it in a way that doesn't, um, uh, you know, doesn't uh, whipsaw, uh, you know, the the share price and things like that. But, you know, I, again, I, I, I view it as a, um, as a sign of confidence and, and talking to them, right. I know they're like, wow, we'd, we'd be buyers at this, at this range because we know what's coming um, down the, down the pike. So. So as a firm, we like to focus on three or four key variables that are really going to drive a, a stock over the next, call it, three to five years. So what do you think are three things this company absolutely has to get right for this stock to be a good investment for both your investors and your employees? You know, uh, you know, I think um, continuing to, you know, continuing to win share in the learning management system market, the LMS market, um, um, you know, we need to continue to, to innovate in that space. We need to continue to, you know, um, build on the strengths that we have by our footprint and recognize that that is one of the, you know, that's one of the assets that we have, right. Is our customers in our, our position um, and, and, and really focus on winning LMS market share. Um, I think, um, you know, the second piece is, is becoming a multi-product company. So we have to cross sell. Right. Um, and, this is again, you know, as I mentioned, this was not necessarily a um, a strength of the company. The company, because because the canvas had been so successful, right? It, it was a one product company. We've been able to, you know, go from um, right before the take private. I think about 18 percent of our customers had had more than one product from us, and um, last year it was about thirty. Uh, thirty-two percent, I think. So far this year, it's about thirty-seven uh, percent um, that have more than one product from us. So, you know, we're getting, we're 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 executing. We've, you know, we've integrated products much tighter. We've uh, made investments in those add-on products. We've trained the sales teams. You know, we've created some specialists. So we're doing the things to to make that happen. We just got to keep doing that um, from a cross-sell perspective. And then I think long term, from a growth perspective, you know, somebody's going to emerge as a platform leader here in education, a la what ServiceNow has done, uh, infrastructure or Salesforce. Um, the, you know, our customers are there's massive app sprawl, right? They want somebody to become that platform and help make sense of all these different apps and be the integration platform for all those different apps, um, as well as to help them, you know, vet those and, and, uh, and give them a platform to be able to differentiate what they do as a, as a, as a institution or a, or a K-12 system. So, so, um, so executing on kind of that platform strategy and building out more features and, and really integrating our partners tightly into the platform, uh, is, is one of the other things that we got to get right over the next, uh, Two to two to three years, and that latter one's a pretty big ambition. Obviously, those companies you mentioned are very large companies where have made people a lot of money. Uh-huh. Is that are you investing internally in like R and D dollars? Is this like that? That's an it's like I I I get how why that makes a lot of sense, but that's a 
um, seems like a big lift from going from kind of like a when you, when you started like a one product LMS company to like a true platform. What does that actually entail? Yeah, um, we are. We're making um, big investments. It really, um, you know, it's not it's not as far you know it's not as 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 far a leap as it may appear because you know we, the LMS already integrates over six hundred partners onto it, right? Um, and um, we've already had to do some of this work in order to integrate our own products, right? As we've become a multi product company. So what what this is really about is making sure that our data infrastructure is uh, open and accessible for to collect data from a lot of other sources, right? And create that, um, create the ability to then report and do analytics and, um, you know, machine learning on all that data. Um, so that that's part of the investment. Uh, part of the investment is, you know, kind of the, the traditional authentication and, and um, identity management pieces. Um, so that every you know you don't have to log into every single solution, right? You can log log in uh, once, and then that um, that reporting, that interface um, investment is the other piece. So it's not it's I mean we're having to do it internally just so that we can get that experience, user experience, be seamless for our products, and it's now a function of how do we do it in a way that expands you know expands the remit outside of our own products. So. Yeah, but there's a lot of uh, um, investment going into that. Um, we made an acquisition about six months ago. A company called Kimono. It's kind of a it's kind of a uh, data translation layer that allows us to you know plug into different systems. So yeah, it, there there is some investment going on there. But um, it, again, it's kind of if you're a fan of Jeffrey Moore, right? Um, you know the 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 company that becomes the gorilla now has a killer app, right? And then they have to go through this process of how do we make other stuff of our own integrate? And then the next step is to extend that to the industry. It's kind of the natural progression of a company like ours, I believe. Well, we've covered a lot of topics and I mean, I'm, you know, I feel like I've learned an incredible amount, but so we're going to close with the question that we ask all of our guests. What, what would you say is the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of your business or company? Yeah, you know, um, I think the most underappreciated thing is, um, and this may be just a function of where we are right now in the market in general, is that, um, you know, um, we are we we look a lot more like a vertical software company than we do a traditional ed tech company, right? Um and and there's a lot of there's a lot of noise in the ed tech space, you know, enrollments in higher ed, and how does that affect different companies? And you've seen some announcements and pre-announcements, and you know, and some earnings misses in in some of the ed tech companies. But you know, really, our business is structured where we are selling to the institution, right? We don't we don't have exposure to the student consumer. It's not a B two C. It's more of a B two B model. It's got all the you know, all the benefits, all the makings of multi-year contracts, non-cancelable, right? Price escalations built in, uh, you know, all of, um, a, a customer that's very reference-based um, and, and, a, and a product that's the, the market share leader. Uh, and so um, I think, I think in, in many ways we get lumped in um, into the wrong bucket, I guess I would say. Think of us as a, a vertical software company who's in ed tech rather than an ed tech company um, that's selling in, you know, selling software. Well, if you can continue to have that low churn and net retention rates that high, um, I think you'll convince people pretty, pretty fast. Steve, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for the time. I've learned a lot. I know, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy hearing both, you know, your story and how you got involved and how the company's transitioned. And then now, you know, what the growth growth trajectory for the future is. So thanks again. Um, uh, it's been, we've really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And it's a, a great conversation. Always good to catch up with you, Ben. Thanks, Steve. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices, and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better, and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at co 
with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again, and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibiker.